Colleagues, uh, ladies and gentlemen, welcome. Welcome to uh, the Australian National University. Um, welcome indeed um, on behalf of colleagues at the College of Law, but also uh, colleagues at the National Security College, my own college. Uh, I want to begin by acknowledging uh, and celebrating the first, first Australians on whose traditional lands we meet and pay our respects to the elders of the Ngunnawal people, past and present. My name is Rory Medcalf. I'm the head of the National Security College here at ANU. And as I said, I'm really pleased to be collaborating on this event with our, um, our colleagues at the College of Law. Uh, the, the catalyst, uh, the excuse for this collaboration is a visit by our distinguished guest uh, for this evening's lecture, uh, Professor Agawa um, from Japan. And the, um, I guess the nature of this presentation is such that we thought it would be a, a perfect reason to work with the College of Law because although at one level um, the presentation today, uh, Professor Agawa's remarks will be on um, strategic issues, security issues, um, really critical issues of foreign uh, and security policy, at another level there is obviously a legal and constitutional element um, to what the Professor will have to say. Now I won't um, preempt empt his, uh, his remarks at all other than to say that um, the topic at hand, the question about Japan's future as a security player in the Indo-Pacific region is obviously very important for Australia. Uh, one of the reasons why uh, it's interesting all the events that we've done uh, at the National Security College this year, uh, touching on Japan and Asian security and maritime security have not only been well attended um, and have evoked much interest in the, the media and the diplomatic community, but um, it's striking that the uh, the video recordings of these events uh, are among our most um, our most popular. So we must be doing something right. I think it demonstrates that um, the the idea that Japan is not relevant to Australia as a security partner is is really quite quite obsolete, and that we have to be quite creative in thinking how do we work with uh, a changing Japan in in the challenging security environment that we all face. Um, I think that tonight's remarks, uh, to my mind, are going to touch on many of these issues and will connect what's happening in Japan, the constitutional and historical dimensions of that, with, I guess, uh, uh, different views on security, security reform, if we can call it that, and the, the tensions around that, with the wider security environment and the, uh, I guess, the demands for a more multipolar response to uh, the changing power balance and changing behaviour in Asia, whether it's in the South China Sea, the East China Sea, or the wider, um, the wider Indo-Pacific. And this matters to Australia for some very obvious reasons. Um, and I'm not sure whether submarines will, mention, will be mentioned tonight, but um, that could well be one of, those, one of those reasons. I'll say one or two words about our distinguished visitor before we uh, begin. Um, so uh, Professor uh, Naoyuki Agawa teaches American constitutional law and history, as well as the history of Japan-US relations as the Professor of the um, Faculty of Policy Management at Keio University in Japan. And I think uh, for those of you who know Japan, Keio University needs no introduction. He's also served as Dean of the Faculty and as Vice President, Vice President I'm sorry, International of the University uh, and has so been responsible for building a lot of the very strong relationships that that university has with other prestigious and leading universities internationally, including this one. Um, now, Professor Agawa was also um, uh, a diplomat uh, at, at one time. He was uh, Minister for Public Affairs at the Embassy of Japan in Washington uh, between 2002 and 2005, another earlier and interesting phase in US-Japan relations. He's also been a senior counsel and major international legal firms in Japan and in the United States. So academia, diplomacy and the law, a really, I think, powerful combination of, um, of knowledge and, um, and practitioner background to bring to tonight's conversation. Uh, Professor Agawa's books are too many for me to mention uh, all by name here, but it's interesting that several of them have touched on the maritime dimension of the US-Japan relationship, and I think that goes to tonight's presentation, which will go to Japan's wider maritime relations in the region as well. Um, so look, I'm going to um, end my introduction there and just note that um, we're very, very much on the record tonight, so when we come to the question and answer session, please Feel free to ask your questions. Please mention who you are so that we, we, uh, we have it on the record and the speaker knows who he's talking to. Um, and please allow time for others to ask questions as well. Um, with that, I'm going to invite Professor Agawa to take the stage. Thank you. Thanks.
Thank you very much, uh, Professor Mika, for your very kind introduction. Uh, I'm sort of awed by the fact that I'm standing here at uh, Australian National University because I have heard so much about your university, how prestigious you are. And in fact, my university, Kerry University, has had a long-term relationship with you and your university. And uh, I, as uh, Vice President in charge of international collaboration, has uh, met with many of your colleagues in, in, in the past. So, uh, I, I, as you said, that I have been doing various things. And, and, and I re I'm right now trying to, at this late stage in my life, try to concentrate on American uh, constitutional history that doesn't have very much to do with Australia-Japan relationship. But nevertheless, I was asked to come down to Australia. When I was offered to come here, uh, I was shown whether I wanted to go to London or Australia. And without any hesitation, I said Australia, because I had never been here before. And I'm very happy to be here. Uh, today, I, I'm going to talk about uh, Japan's new security policy. And uh, uh, I think I would like to uh, particularly talk about the new security legislation that just passed uh, recently. Uh, but, you know, uh, and also because I would like to hear you and I would like to uh, uh, receive questions and, and rather have discussions, lively discussions than me talking uh, for a long time. Uh, it's always the case that I have heard me speak before. And it's not that exciting. So I would like to ask each one of you to think about what you want to ask me or what you want to discuss. And so I will try to uh, make my speech shorter than long. And perhaps I will try to speak for 20 minutes or 25 minutes, and then uh, the floor will be open. But before doing, uh, getting into the subject matter, I just wanted to show you uh, some a little entertaining series of photos so that you get uh, interested in this thing. This has a lot to do with what I'm going to talk about. And I, I just, because I have once written a book entitled uh, uh, Friendship on the Seas, the Navy-to-Navy -Navy relationship between the United States and Japan uh, after the war, and I think that something similar is beginning to happen, uh, that in terms of maritime security, Australia and Japan are closely, uh, more and more closely working together. And here's uh, the, the, the series of slides that show how closely we are currently working. So the title of this series, uh, series of slides is Japan and Australia, Friends on the Seas. Um, let me just show you. On October 18th, uh, uh, we had a, a thing called a fleet review. Uh, this is done every three years. In, in Japan. And well, the, the reason why it's once three years is because uh, on the occasion of the uh, establishment, an anniversary of the establishment of Japan's Self-Defense Force, and I will tell you why we have to call it Self-Defense Force later, uh, uh, each service takes turns to, to uh, do some kind of ceremony. And the Navy, obviously, has the advantage of having lots of nice ships. And so this year happened to be that the year to, uh, to be done by the, my friends in the Navy, oops, I'm not supposed to say that that's in violation of the Constitution, but uh, nevertheless, I will say Japanese Navy. And uh, it was, I was invited to be on board one of those ship vessels, and it was very, very interesting. Here's uh, how they do this. And, and in fact, uh, those of you who are familiar with the Navy may know that uh, this I don't know the English term, but this mobile uh, fleet review, uh, only the Japanese Navy can now, and is now doing, others are stationary uh, fleet review. Now, it's not only the 40-some ships and vessels of the Japan Maritime Self-Defense Force that did this wonderful uh, show of uh, discipline and, and maneuverability and everything else. Somebody else can, by the way, I need to show this wonderful submarine that we have, we have. <laughs> and uh, this is Soryu Kras, uh, a submarine. And uh, I would like each one of you to write your, to your congressman or senator <laughs> and urge uh, 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 the government to buy this thing uh, because it's simply very, very good. And uh, I'm not employed by Mitsubishi or anybody, but I think uh, it's a fact that this is one of the best no-nuclear submarines ever in, in the world. 
And I think the more I think about it, the more I'm convinced that it's not only, only the sales and buying and development of this thing, but uh, once you uh, decide to, to use Japanese technology and develop uh, Japan Australia joint project, and I understand that it will last for 40 years or so. My uh, experience, having written that book, Navy to Navy Relationship between Japan and the United States, is the fact that uh, uh, the Maritime Self Defense Force and the US Navy work so closely together. Why? Because they have worked together for so many years. I mean, obviously, uh, those guys who are manning all these Japanese vessels uh, don't speak English too well. Uh, and, and they are not used to working with uh, American sailors and, and, and officers. But over the years, they have been working so much together. And I'm sure that the new future US, uh, Australia, Japan relationship, including the joint development and joint maintenance and joint everything, centering around the, sub the submarine project, will allow us two countries and two navies to accumulate experiences of doing this and doing that. So I think in that respect also, uh, I would hope that uh, your country will decide to buy this ship. I'm not a salesman, so stop here. <laughs> now, one obvious thing about this thing is that the, in addition to 40 vessels, uh, or 40 some vessels, uh, there are several navies that uh, participate in this thing. And one, and, and the most significantly, is the US Navy. And this is USS Ronald Reagan, uh, who, which recently arrived at Yokosuka and became part of the Yokosuka uh, fleet. And uh, it was not actively engaged in this review process, but it was in the background. And Prime Minister Abe, after presiding over the review, fleet review, flew on the halo to USS Ronald Reagan and confirmed how close a Navy-to-Navy -Navy -Navy relationship is. And in addition, two uh, Aegis class one may not have been, but the two vessels from the U.S. Navy were actually in the receiving uh, or to be reviewed uh, file, and they were there too. But lo and behold, here is uh, HMAS Stewart, and uh, this is your proud Australian Navy vessel, and this was also in the uh, line to be reviewed by President, uh, Prime Minister Abe, and we were very happy that uh, one of your Navy vessels uh, came all the way uh, from your country to join this Grand Fleet Review. Also interestingly, uh, there was an Indian vessel, I think for the first time in the history of Fleet Review. And uh, I was impressed that they have some very dandy ships and, and this was together with other countries. Now, um, in addition, there was a French frigate and most importantly, and very importantly, there was a Republic of Korea vessel. And uh, this shows how closely these countries have been working together in terms of Indo-Pacific Asia, maritime security issues. And this is just an indication how close, how, how, how we are becoming more closely together and trying to do things. This is just a ceremony, but you can imagine on the seas, uh, increasingly doing many, many more things uh, off the coast. What was interesting, of course, is the fact that uh, nobody expects a Chinese vessel to be here. In fact, there was none. But also interesting, in my historical sort of sentimentalism is the fact that there was no Royal Navy vessel here. So things have changed. And that's part of the history that your country has gone through and our country has gone through and all the countries in this area uh, since the uh, early period of the 20th century of experience. And that's a factor, an element of that. Now, um, changing the gear, I just want to show you a couple of uh, uh, maps. And this is China, Japan, and the Far East uh, looked from distance. And you can see that the China is huge, and Japan is on the periphery. And this is how we have perceived our position. And the location of our islands uh, has had lots of impact upon how we uh, think about ourselves. And uh, we have this sort of periphery mentality still. 
Um, China is dominant in this area. It was in the old days and it is now increasing so. Here is Australia. I'm not indicating that the eastern half of New Guinea is still yours, but uh, uh, this is showing the area and I think that uh, New Zealand and, and uh, Australia. This gives it an impression, I think, that uh, Japan and Australia are far away. I mean, the China map shows Australia somewhere down there, but uh, this shot sh uh, shows how far Japan is. And, uh, uh, you know, on the surface, it doesn't seem to be any logical link between the two. But here's another map. I was attending an uh, uh, international conference among academics, and, and one New Zealander uh, showed this map and said that you guys have been watching incorrect maps for such a long time. This is the correct map. And lo and behold, the New Zealand is on top of the world and, uh, and also in the center of the world, which I thought was very interesting. By the way, my sympathy to you for losing the game against all blacks. <laughs> uh, well, next time. Uh, now, this map seems to show a few other things as well. One thing that struck about this map is the fact that while we talk a lot about the Indian Ocean and the Pacific Ocean, they are one and the same. Uh, I think that makes a contrast uh, as against the uh, relationship between the Atlantic Ocean and the Pacific Ocean. In that case, I think two oceans are clearly separate. And that's why you, you, somebody had to build the Panama Canal. Uh, Mediterranean and the, uh, you know, the Gulf and, and the uh, Red Sea are also separated. But here, except for islands, uh, there are some straits, but basically, it's an open sea everywhere. And this is, I think, the basis of the geopolitical perception. And, and we have not paid very much attention to this fact that this is one vast ocean. Another thing that, that I have noticed is the fact that uh, of all the Asian countries that you see at the bottom, Japan is the closest to the United States of America. Anybody who was interested in, who has been interested in Japan, uh, has had to come to Asia via Japan. Of course, from the east coast of the United States, a lot of people went uh, east to, to come around the African uh, continent and eventually to reach Japan. But, and Komodo Perry did that the first time he came, but uh, since then, this is the line between uh, West Coast and Alaska, and then on to the Japanese archipelago is the way. And if anybody wants to go to China, they have to pass by uh, Japan. And I think this is very significant if you think about uh, the current relationship, strategic relationship between Japan and the United States. And number three, let me show you another map. Uh, this is the map that I sort of created from the, the, the previous map. China is in a very interesting situation because to the east uh, there is Japan and to the west is India. And on top of that, uh, this is a heavy landmass, sort of uh, putting a lid on the whole continent, Australia. And in between there are a lot of uh, smaller countries and Indonesia islands. But this triangle, um, not only in terms of theory, but in terms of geography, uh, if you think about how to tame the dragon, so to speak, China and territorial exp uh, expansion, if any, uh, seems to be natural and logical. So I just wanted to show you and share this uh, map with you. Now, having said that, I think there have been a few pieces of good news recently. And let me just uh, quickly list them. Number one is the subject matter that I'm going to talk about the passage of the new security and, and uh, legislation uh, back, in, back on 14 September. And I'll tell you more about it. The second uh, piece of good news is, of course, the final TPP agreement among the 12 Pacific Rim countries. 
your country is one of them, and Japan is one of them. And I know that people had to struggle and work hard, and there were disagreements. But finally, they came to an agreement that should be and that will be implemented, hopefully. Uh, but this is such a tremendous news for the region. Number three, I think I consider this to be a piece of good news. And the USS Lassen sailed within 12 nautical miles of artificial islands. China claims to be its territory in the South China Sea on 27 October. And perhaps I could talk about it later a little more. Um, there are mixed views about that and different views on that. But I think that the, the United States of America finally uh, set the tone of this thing. And it has a lot of, uh, uh, I think, international law implications, particularly in view of the UNCLOS uh, Hague arbitration panel going on and taking up the case. And number four, and in close connection with these events, is the recently held, I think it was 1st November and 2nd November, uh, meeting in Seoul, and uh, meetings in Seoul uh, between and among the Chinese Premier and Korean President and Japanese Prime Minister. And I thought that it was such a wonderful thing. After all, uh, I must say, that the Chinese leaders and the Korean leaders had refused to meet with uh, the Prime Minister Abe for three years or so uh, altogether. And Chinese had be begun to change, but this is the first time that uh, President Park agreed to get together in a formal way. And I must say that uh, each one of them uh, behaved uh, themselves relatively well and uh, that they were restrained and they talked more about what they can do together than what they disagreed on. Um, I do know that they raised some sensitive issues, but overall, overall I think that the most important thing is that they agreed to continue to talk. And that's very constructive. Uh, now, about the passage of the new legislation for peace and security, I know that I'm talking uh, at the Australian National University uh, with such uh, uh, great experts on this. You know, after all, it's the Center for Military and Security Law uh, uh, where I'm talking about and to whom I'm talking. So I will not go into detail. But let me just give you my impression of what this law is all about. I think there are three or four very important points. Number one, uh, this is an effort to uh, make Japan's defense uh, policy and defense system more seamless. That is that uh, because of the nature of Japan's security policy and the history of security policy, here's this law and here's that law, and it's very difficult to see what comes next and what is you know, ha going to happen if something happens then, you know, what level, so forth and so on. So this new legislation, um, I think the more I studied, the first time I, I read it, I didn't understand the thing. But I, I'm not sure if I understand it very well now. Uh, it's very technical. But uh, the so-called more seamless uh, measures for peace and security, I think that's true. Uh, from the peacetime op uh, operation to gray area operation, which is not really in the in the law, but also uh, important the influence situation and the uh, in a situation in which the survival of Japan is at stake and a direct armed attack and that kind of things. So this clear clarifies a lot of things that, that were vague and that were missing in the previous uh, series of laws. That's my understanding. Secondly, more more than anything else, I think this is an effort to. Uh, reinforce and make US-Japan alliance more effective, more credible, and more efficient. Uh, over the years, uh, policymakers and people in uniform have been working very closely as to how to make Japan-US alliance work. Uh, but uh, things changed, and uh, they were not particularly successful. They have not, they had not been, I think they have done enormously a good job in somehow maintaining and improving the way in which that they, the two countries work in the security areas uh, on the basis of the security treaty. But nevertheless, uh, this law will augment 
that wonderful relationship furthermore and I think that the, uh, they will be able to do a few things that they had not been able to do in the future. Now perhaps more interesting particularly to you I think this law will also enable Japan uh, for the first time perhaps to work with countries other than the United States uh, more actively and more effectively in the area of security law. And uh, there's no word, such word as Australia in, in, in the law, of course, but these laws apply uh, in some instances to countries other than the United States under certain conditions and under certain circumstances. Uh, and I think a lot of people have in their minds uh, one country, that is Australia. And so uh, we'll see how this will be implemented. And, and, and it's not that um, the law will change the whole thing, but I, on the basis of the law, there's a lot of room for Australia and Japan to, to do more in the area of security laws. The, most of the things that Australia and Japan will be able to do will be limited to, for Japan to take uh, logistical support surveillance and, and search and that kind of uh, traditionally Japan kind of things. But nevertheless, I think that this has never been clear. And so this is a first step, uh, one big step. And lastly, I think this will enable Japan to be more actively involved in international peacekeeping operations. And uh, there are some technical changes of law, so forth and so on. Now, why this law now? And I will talk about the logic behind the support, and I would like to talk about the opposition behind the law. And uh, to, to talk about Japan's post-war security policy and constitutional issues, I would need about two hours really to go through that. I don't think you have that much time and you will be bored. Uh, but you remember in August 1945, we were a vanquished country. Uh, nobody wanted to see Japan as a military power again. Uh, frankly speaking, we are a very bad guy, group of bad guys. And naturally, the United States and as well as other countries wanted to see, make sure that Japan will never, would never again embark upon adventurist military policy and invasion and other things. I think it's a, all, it is, except for some some revisionists, I think that's the consensus among the people of Japan that we did something terrible. And in fact, the uh, August 14th statement by Prime Minister Abe reflecting upon Japan's past clearly indicates that. Now, uh, hence the new constitution of Japan had this famous or notorious Article 9. Uh, by the way, I'm for Article 9. I think it's very good that the country reflecting upon the past, uh, decides that we'll never again be engaged in uh, aggressive war. And I think that's a wonderful thing that the United States kindly imposed upon us. Uh, but th 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 there was a problem here, because when the war was over, MacArthur's uh, presumption was that everybody will be happy and, and will live forever, happily. And things didn't turn out to be that way. And uh, soon there was this uh, Cold War situation. In fact, General MacArthur wanted Japan to rearm in nine, as, uh, when the Korean War happened. And then Prime Minister Yoshida said, well, it may be a marvelous idea, but I don't think we could do that because I remember this Article 9 thing that you kindly gave to us. So uh, General MacArthur later said, it's not, it was not my idea, it was a <laughs> Japanese idea. Uh, this is, by the way, uh, too much of a simplification. It's much more complicated, but just to make you know, a, a sort of simplified version of the story. So uh, Japan had to think about, and the United States had to think about, how to maintain security and peace of Japan. And there are two answers to that. One is essentially to develop a, a new self-defense force. And it's going to be limited. It's going to be only engaged in individual self-defense or defense of uh, 
Uh, I shouldn't say individual because nobody was thinking about the dif distinction between the individual and the collective, but uh, just to defend to the minimum extent and the maximum extent that they could do uh, the Japan uh, proper. And, and that was their mission. In fact, in the initial period, it was so weak that nobody thought that it would be a mighty power in the future. In order to fill the gap, so to speak, and, and augment that the precarious situation that Japan was in, uh, Japan and the United States agreed to enter into an alliance. Uh, and this is the beginning of U.S.-Japan Security Treaty in 1951. And uh, this is lasting, uh, this has been lasting until now. And, and this has been very successful in terms of deterrence and in terms of everything else in, in the area of security. Now, the United States under this treaty is obligated to defend Japan. It was not so under the 1951 treaty, but uh, the revised treaty of 1960 changed that. So they are obligated to uh, defend Japan. Japan is not. And why so? Uh, well, nobody on the U.S. side expected Japan to be able to defend the United States at the time. But at the same time, Japan, because of Article 9, decided that that could not be done uh, physically or uh, legally. And hence, uh, the United States thought about it. And nevertheless, they entered into the security treaty because in return, uh, the United States uh, had, and uh, Japan agreed that uh, the United States armed forces would be allowed to use uh, bases uh, in Japan, not only for the defense of Japan, but also for the security and, and peace and security. In the, I think the initial language was Far East. Uh, the history of Japan's cooperation with the United States in the security area is the history of expansion of that, the Japan proper and Far East, and, and then wider East Asia. And then I think we are now beginning to talk about Indo-Asia Pacific. Now, so there was this inherent imbalance within the structure of the treaty and this constitutional restraint upon Japan to not to be able to be uh, a normal ally of any type. So Japan has been working very hard to balance the inherent imbalance by creative means. And I think that began particularly after the Cold War, beginning in the 1980s when the Cold War sort of reheated. And, and the, at that time, Japan was able to cooperate closely with the United States because the, the threat was Soviet Union. But this threat shifted from Soviet Union to North Korea and then to somebody else. So the question is how to, to, to make it possible for Japan to make sure that the Japan's defense is effective, but also for Japan to, in correcting the inherent imbalance, to uh, be contributing more to the area security and peace. And that, I think, is the Japan's post-war security policy expanding to this day. This is too simple an explanation, and, and I'm sure that technically that we have a lot more issues to talk about. And, and here you are, by, however, uh, there is clearly a changing uh, security environment in this area, and I don't have to do that. And so Prime Minister Abe began to take this proactive contribution to peace that in order for Japan to more effectively defend itself, uh, we cannot do everything by ourselves. We have to work with others, more closely with the United States, but more uh, actively with other countries as well. So this new law is basically uh, enacted in, with the background of this changing national security environment and also because of the need that no, man, uh, that, that no, no country, no single country can uh, uh, secure uh, its safety and peace by itself. I'm sort of tempted to uh, sort of recite in front of all these English-speaking people uh, one poem by John Donne, English poet. Uh, you remember that he said, no man, no man is an island, 
but part of the continent, entire of itself. Every man is a piece of the continent, a part of the main. And I think the new security legislation actually says that uh, this law is uh, based upon the realization that Japan cannot alone uh, defend itself and we have to work more closely with others. Um, I think I have spoken more than 20 minutes now, but let's, let me uh, please bear with me for another five minutes. And uh, one interesting thing and one important thing is that uh, this is the logic that is behind the, the new security legislation. But surprisingly, uh, there was a very strong opposition to the passage of the new law. You may have heard about it. In fact, even today, the, uh, according to some polls, the, if you ask, if a Japanese person is asked by a poll taker as to whether he or she supports the legislation, about 30 to 35 percent of the people do say, yes, I do, as opposed to 50 to 50 perhaps 5%. It varies from newspapers to newspaper, and I don't know why, but uh, it's a technical thing. And clearly, uh, the opposition, on, at least according to some polls, is uh, bigger than the support. Uh, how, with with the, the caveat that it seems that the support number is slightly increasing, and the opposition number is slightly decreasing, but nevertheless, there's still a very strong sense among some Japanese that this is very bad. In fact, that you have seen a lot of demonstrations on the streets of Tokyo. And uh, why then is the opposition to this level? Uh, some uh, uh, parties and some political leaders call this law as a war legislation rather than peace legislation, but security legislation. And many people began to talk about the possibility of Japan going back to the conscription system. Some of my friends talked about it and asked me if there would be conscription. I don't know why they were, they were thinking that way. There are, I think, two reasons for that. And I think that, uh, A, there is still a very strong sense of passivism. And, 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 and this is reflected and by and expressed in Article 9. Uh, Japan has liked the idea that we have declared that we will never engage in war. And somehow the idea that the Japanese armed forces would be overseas, possibly using force, uh, it sort of shocks people. And, 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 and if you read this carefully, uh, the, that's the ultimate and, and very rare occasion in which Japan will be allowed to use force. In fact, the law is very strict about under what circumstances Japan would be allowed to, or armed forces would be allowed to use force, but this notion that the Japan will send troops abroad again and, and possibly use force is, gets a very sort of strong guts feeling, uh, yuck kind of thing, and that's number one. And in fact, majority of the Japanese constitutional scholars have stated that, that at least part of the law, uh, where the, there is this collective security, uh, collective uh, uh, self-defense right, is concerned is unconstitutional. I don't tend to think so, but uh, the, the best and uh, uh, well, most well-educated and bright constitutional scholars uh, they all talk about it. Uh, so that's, that's one issue. Number two is I think that uh, there is this, may I invent a word, passivism as opposed to pacifism. I think this is based upon history. As I said, that uh, we got terrible experience uh, throughout the 1930s and 40s, and, and they, we were determined never to engage in that kind of uh, 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 war and invasion that caused many casualties and death among the Japanese, but also to many countries in Asia and Australia suffer from Japan's military adventurism uh, in the past. But there, I think that there's a consensus on that, but there are two 
views derive from that, one is to say that never again will we be doing anything outside of the uh, outside of Japan, and that just to send troops abroad is a bad idea because that could lead to the resurgence of military and the resurgence of many deaths and so forth. No. Another view, or the second view, and contrary view, is exactly what Prime Minister Abe has been talking about. That is precisely because we were so bad in terms of uh, the area security. This is a time based upon our policy of maintaining peace and be very restricted about our defense stature, that we should be doing more. Uh, we should not be only concerned about our security, but also how to keep the area uh, safer and more secure. Uh, so, in, in, in conclusion, I would like to say because of this very strong uh, opposition, and, and this is not really based upon the sort of technical analysis of the law, but more on the Japanese people's feeling. Uh, if somebody asks that this is the beginning of a uh, process of Japan becoming just like anybody else, having a normal or, or regular uh, army and navy and air force, I don't think that will happen. Even under this law, uh, what Japan can do and what the uh, self-defense force will be able to do will be very restrained. And I think correctly so. Um, there have been some impression on the part of America, and at least to the extent that I talked about this thing uh, last year, that you know, now we are not only talking about the alliance, we, we're talking about how we together can be actively engaged in international peace uh, operation. And, and that, that's, uh, uh, I think, over expectation. I think it would be more limited. Uh, the Japan will continue to be uh, engaged in defensive measures and no military measures. And only in very rare occasions are we ready now to uh, uh, defend some other countries' vessels and, and forces. Now, on the other hand, I don't think that this will lead to military adventure at all. Uh, in fact, Gallup does an annual survey uh, of uh, uh, asking uh, people in 64 countries uh, as to whether uh, somebody who is asked this question will uh, stand up and take arms and defend uh, his or her country if invaded by a foreign country. It's something like 80% of the Chinese who say yes. And Australia, I don't know, 90% or I don't know. Uh, the United States is roughly, I don't have the number, I should have brought that, uh, is probably about 50%, 45%. I don't remember the number. Somebody may know that. Germany is low because of the historical uh, records and historical memories, 30%. Uh, Western Europe tend to be a little lower. Japan is 11 percent, and this is the lowest among 64 countries. So if we were to be more actively engaged in security measures, A, it will be restrained, and B, it will again take time. And I think Japan will be very cautious, and if anybody worries about Japan becoming a mighty military power, no worry. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Agawa, and please stay, uh, stay with us for some questions. Um, I'm glad that in your presentation, as well as the, um, the wide-ranging geopolitical dimensions, and this, this map, will, I think, will make us all think a little bit um, anew about um, our place in the world, so thank you for that. But as well as that, I'm glad that you did touch on um, the question of the, the opposition uh, and the criticism of the new security uh, legislation in Japan, because that is certainly a dimension that um, gets a lot of attention in the international media, and I think I think we, we all have questions about about that. Um, I'll take a few questions from the um, the group now, and um, we'll um, try and have time to answer them. So, any questions or comments from the audience, please. Uh, Richard Simons from the Coral Bell School here at ANU. Uh, Prime Minister Abe at the United Nations recently outlined. Japan's intentions to seek a permanent seat on the UN Security Council. Uh, it's not the first time for Japan that he's renewed that intention. So what policy trade-offs do you think would be necessary if Japan was to be a realistic prospect to gain a permanent UNSC seat? 
I know enough about where we are on, on that. I think it has always been Japan's desire to have a more presence and more right uh, in the United Nations uh, composition of the Security Council and otherwise. Uh, when I was uh, serving as Minister for Public Affairs at the Embassy of Japan, uh, you may remember that Japan worked very hard to get the new system of Security Council and try to be one of the newly proposed and changed uh, uh, permanent member. It didn't work out. And so uh, I think that desire is still uh, with us and with Prime Minister Abe. But my impression is that it's, it's a very difficult proposition uh, and that uh, it will be very difficult uh, to, to achieve that. I'm sure that my friends in the foreign ministry have such an excellent and creative idea to make it possible, but I don't know. I'm not privy to that. Um, this, however, uh, reflects the reality of the United Nations uh, Security Council. I think that it's basically deadlocked because now uh, the uh, <coughs> permanent members of the Security Council consist of uh, the United States and uh, Great Britain and France and then China and Soviet Union. And well, wh for a while we thought that the Soviet Union, well, I should say Russia. I'm old, so I tend to say that. Uh, but uh, Russia, uh, we th all thought that has changed. But recent incidents seem to show that they are back in the old mode. And so uh, when that kind of country has a veto power, it, it wouldn't work. And uh, on the other hand, China is increasingly assertive. And anything that might uh, uh, jeopardize their position vis-a-vis -vis the world community, including some issues in this part of the world, he will, they will certainly veto that. And may I say, as I said in the series of film, uh, slides showing the naval uh, review, the fleet review, that I'm not sure if the British uh, government is still as influential as it used to be. And, uh, the recent visit by Xi Jinping to Buckingham Palace and given a wonderful room to stay there uh, was not a very security-oriented move, but I think simply uh, Britons need to have a very good economic relationship. So all these things seem to indicate that uh, uh, the whole world uh, will have to think about how to make it more effective. Uh, I'm not that optimistic about the possibility of doing that, but uh, either there or in some other fashion that a new mechanism is needed. I don't know how, and perhaps somebody else may be able to talk about it. You may have Thank some you. idea. Thank no, you. No, it's, it, it's your lecture, Professor. I, um, I, I, I would note that, um, mm -hmm. that there are other countries who also probably lay claim to permanent seats, uh, not this one, but perhaps India. Um, so that there, is a, there, is a big, uh, there is a big debate to be had. Um, another question, perhaps, from the, uh, the audience, this gentleman here. Steve Benness, Department of International Relations here at the ANU. Thank you very much for your, your lecture. I found it very interesting that while you were talking about cooperation with the navies, uh, around the periphery of, of, of China, that the Australian Navy, if I'm reading the newspaper correctly, is exercising with the PRC, even live fire exercise. <laughs> and I'm wondering, um, as you describe the cooperation among the countries around China, um, what do you think about the possibility of, of the alternative, the engagement uh, activity that Australia is indeed involved in? And as you know, all of the countries in the periphery want good relations with both China um, and Japan and the US and everyone else. Um, but is, the, is this notion of working with India Australia, the United States, South Korea, um, as the Chinese describe it, is this a containment policy? Is that what you're suggesting and, and proposing that um, we cooperate in? Thanks, Pete. I think there's just two questions there, perhaps, but please. 
With respect to uh, your Navy's uh, exercise with uh, China, I, I, I just had heard that uh, they even did fire, live fire exercise. But uh, in terms of joint exercise, I'm not surprised that they do that. I mean, even the Japanese Navy or the Self Maritime Self-Defense War has been trying to uh, do that kind of exercise all the time. I think the, from time to time, depending upon the political situation, they refused uh, to do anything with us. But uh, in the past, uh, they, they, the, their fleet has, fleets have visited Japan, they did uh, uh, you know, joint rescue operation exercise and so forth. So, so does the United States, uh, so does very many countries in the world. I think it's very important that we get to know each other very well. And I, I think, in fact, I, I just heard when I was in Hong Kong uh, a, a couple of days ago that the fact that the Japanese, uh, I mean American uh, USS Ves uh, Lassen came into the 12-mile zone is a welcome thing for the uh, Chinese Navy, but for the first time they can exercise with the USS Lassen. <laughs> but I don't, I don't know whether that's the case. Um, now, everybody has its, his or her, well, the countries have different uh, situations. I think in Japan's case, we feel that the area environment is more tense and that uh, China is more assertive vis-a-vis -vis Japan and that the, we have this territorial dispute and that we have East China Sea natural resources dispute. And one of the significant things about these uh, talks in Seoul, uh, particularly between China and Japan, was the fact that uh, they agreed to resume talks about the possibility of joint uh, development of gas rigs in East Asia, uh, uh, China Sea, which was agreed on back in 2008. And uh, because of the sensitivity of the area, uh, basically they said, you know, if you are to do this natural gas rigging, uh, that we should think about how we could peacefully together work. Uh, and, and Chinese, may I say, uh, just ignore that agreement and went ahead. So we have our own interests and we have our interest to work more closely with the United States in this area. Uh, in fact, uh, I just met uh, uh, an, a journalist who, who is known to be on China's side in Hong Kong and he uh, asked me why the Japanese people don't think about the possibility of a better way of securing its peace by distancing Japan from the United States. And I thought it was very interesting. And I think that the Chinese are saying that kind of things to everybody. But in any, any event, uh, that's the view. Uh, case in point, South Korea uh, is in a very difficult position I think that they are so close to China and for all sorts of reasons, uh, my understanding, they haven't really uh, voiced their support for the South China Sea uh, Lassen issue yet. And uh, I think that uh, some of the ASEAN countries are so afraid or maybe in very in favor of China that they are not joining a strong statement among ASEAN countries. Uh, the question, however, is all these, given all these uh, different views, to what extent uh, uh, countries uh, uh, collectively or unilaterally respond to uh, whatever China does. And I think that what we need to do, and I hope that Australia will be uh, with us, is that if China does this, that response will be this, and if China does that, response will be this. It's neither a simple engagement nor a, a very strong opposition per se, but just to have a very clear set of uh, predictable uh, sort of outcome uh, so that they know what we will do and we know what we will do. And, and that way that we can avoid needless confrontation and also uh, I hope that China will restrain themselves. That's my feeling on that. Thank you, Professor. We're getting close to time, but I want to take one more question. In fact, there's a few hands raised, so what I'll do is take 
these three questions and I will let you decide how briefly you wish to reply to them, perhaps um, combining your reply into, into one response, because I know there are voices that want to be heard. So, George Brennan, uh, you had a question, I think. Yeah, mine was... George is a colleague at the National Security College. Yeah, thank you. Uh, mine was a, a further question on the bilateral relationship with Korea. I mean, okay, despite correct. what South Korea, despite what um, I think Japan feels are rather diligent efforts to improve the relationships, it's, the bilateral relationship remains you know, rather difficult since the Second World War and what you thought the prospects were there. That's one question. Japan uh, are okay relations, sir? Uh, one question that I'd like to ask you is one country where you're technically still at war, namely Russia. Now, there are two islands in the Kuril chain. Now, I've spoken to a, uh, several Russians and they say there are no Chinese living there now. In fact, they've all, they've all been told to leave. Is it time that the Japanese government stepped up to the plate and said, we recognise that these are no longer Japanese territory, but part of Russia, and sign the treaty, because technically you're still at war. <laughs> Thank you indeed. So, uh, Russia-Japan relations and a, a, a sore point there. And our last question in the middle of the room there, and I think then we're done. Hello, I'm Joel, I'm a public servant. Um, so, Japan's considered a law-abiding country. It's good, like law-abiding countries. Do you think it would be desirable for Japan to use international arbitration to resolve some of the territorial disputes it's directly involved in, like Takashima Dokdo or the Senkaku Dayutai in, in particular? And is Japan looking to use arbitration to resolve these? Thank you. Thank you very much. So Korea, Russia and uh, arbitration, please. Sir. Uh, I have only a minute and a half left. If I can answer all these questions, I will be employed somewhere else. Uh, so let me try. We'll let you go two minutes over. <laughs> <laughs> let me try my best, and and I don't want to lie that I uh, say something that I don't know. Uh, simply, I don't know the answers, but I have some feelings about some of the questions that I I have received on the Korea-Japan relationship, Soviet. I'm sorry, I keep saying Soviet-Russia-Japan Russia, relationship and arbitration. Uh, number one, Korea. Uh, there was a time about five years ago that the Japanese were so optimistic about our friendship with Korea that I heard from somebody that among the uh, young Japanese uh, female diplomats, uh, the number one uh, uh, place to, that they desired to be stationed was Seoul <laughs> for several reasons. One, Korean guys are so dandy and handsome <laughs> and so sexy. Uh, number two, the food is good, and three, they are very friendly. Now, over the past five years, things have changed, and there have been a lot of uh, speculations and studies as to why this happened, and I don't have time to go into that. Now, uh, it is true that uh, the relationship has been rocky, uh, but my very subjective feeling is that this is not really based upon any serious current issues between the two countries. We talk a lot about Dokuto, well, I should say, Sen uh, Takeshima Dokuto issue. And um, uh, Koreans are very unhappy about the way in which we s continue to say that that's our territory. We are un very unhappy about the fact that they say this is Dokuto, right? But, uh, Despite that territorial dispute, unlike Senkaku, uh, no Japanese in his or her same mind will ever try to take it back by force. In fact, we are so comfortable that the airplanes in both countries fly over that area without any problem, and their you know, traffic control is going on. So the question really is how we are going to, A, hopefully overcome some of the sensitive and touchy issues such as comfort women, uh, territory issues, and the colonial uh, uh, past, and also some uh, forced labor issues. But separate from that, I always tell my Korean friends that, uh, you know, you have some reasons to be uh, feeling bad about our past relationship, but that 
shouldn't be the reason why we, we cannot work together. So I hope that this three-party meeting and Park to other meeting, uh, they came to a reason that they can, despite these disagreements, that they can work together for the area security, for the economy and everything. Number two, uh, Soviet, I mean, Russia. Russia, I will not uh, speculate on that. And there have been a lot of talks about what kind of options we have. My sense, however, is that there are certain things in our life that it's better not to resolve. And this may be one of those. And uh, uh, it depends on how much uh, Russia needs us and how much we need them. And there are reasons why we need Russia's help in many areas. And in, in certain ways, Russians are very practical. And so they will work with us uh, with or without the resolution of, of the territory issues. Territory issues are, I think, uh, fundamentally something that the countries cannot easily yield to. Number three, arbitration. I have heard uh, the position that Japan should try arbitration with respect to Senkaku Island. And in fact, there has been some strong voice for that. Uh, one uh, very famous international law uh, professor that I know back in the United States said, you know, Japan should indicate that we are ready to uh, do that kind of things. And China will not say no. And that's going to be a major public relations coup. Uh, but I don't think that our position is that. I think our position is that there's no territorial dispute there, and therefore we are not in a position to, to, to go into arbitration. Uh, I've been thinking a lot about it, but I don't claim to know the correct answer or whether we have any options there. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you all for your, for your time. You. Professor, your colleagues, before we end, I'm going to ask my, uh, my colleague, Dr. Hitoshi uh, Nasu from the College of Law to give the vote of thanks uh, before, we, uh, before we conclude. As co-director of the Center for Military and Security Law, uh, my role here is very simple, uh, to thank uh, Professor Gawa uh, for uh, sharing his insight uh, into this very controversial uh, uh, issue uh, surrounding Japan. Uh, he certainly shared with us uh, the uh, very important background uh, and different views and uh, a broader context, uh, which often uh, is very hard to understand from, uh, for people outside uh, uh, because of the media's tendency uh, to uh, uh, highlight or uh, emphasize a particular aspect or one side of the story. So it was very, much, uh, very fortunate uh, for us to be given this opportunity uh, to uh, understand uh, um, much deeper um, uh, sort of issues and uh, uh, context in which the controversy has been uh, arisen. Uh, so um, uh, I thank you uh, for that uh, presentation. And now I invite uh, the audience to uh, join me in thanking Professor Gawa. Thank you very much. Thank you.